for policy to be substantive and sustained, we need political will. In our next session, Mary Crooks, CEO of the Victorian Women's Trust and gracious sponsor for today's event, will be talking to political leaders on their priorities for women coming up to the next election. On our panel today, we have Emma Keeley, Nationals Member for Lowen in the Victorian Legislative Assembly and Shadow Minister for Women who will be joining us online. We also have Dr. Samantha Ratnan, Leader of the Victorian Greens, Member for Northern Metropolitan Region in the Victorian Legislative Council and Greens Spokesperson for Women. These fabulous powerhouse women are joined by Fiona Patton, Leader of the Reason Party and Member for Northern Metropolitan Region in the Victorian Legislative Council. Fiona also recently headed up the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry into Homelessness. Thank you all so much for being here today and for the incredible work that each of you do. If these wonderful speakers could come and join me and Mary will be with us Okay, thank you. Uh, and on behalf of this panel, um, I'd like to acknowledge our First Nation peoples uh, and see this as a wonderful moment in time in the year or so ahead where we might be able to come together uh, more than ever before uh, and um, till the ground to get a yes vote in a constitutional enshrinement of the voice and then deal with um, truth telling and treaty um, as the next chapter in this nation's life. Um, so welcome to everyone and um, I wish I could have been here even at one o'clock today but I've actually been up on work in the Yarra Valley um, at the opening of a, the fourth campus of the Public Education Systems Centre for Student Leadership which started in a plane uh, and, uh, and we now have four campuses and one of the young guys I was talking to as he showed me around the campus, comes from Williamstown High, and I asked him what his community learning project is, and he said, we're going to fix homelessness. <laughs> 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 it's great. Good on it. Um, so welcome to Samantha and Fiona, uh, and you'll have to help me in how we cue Emma here. Emma is behind us. Welcome, <laughs> Emma. <laughs> Goodness me. That's a bit unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear her. Emma just needs to unmute. You're on mute. Oh, if you ask Emma to unmute. Emma, can you unmute? <laughs> I feel like I'm looking over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'd like to do, um, um, Tanya has supplied four very good questions as part of the briefing uh, uh, and what I'd like to do is to pose these questions to our three speakers um, in turn, I think, so they can either agree and or build on those questions uh, and, and then to actually have at least ten minutes or so at the end of this session to have Q&A with yourselves in the audience. Um, and the questions that Tanya has provided, which I think um, go to the core of policy and program issues, how, how important is the gender lens? If it is important, well, I'm saying yes, it is. It's crucial. Um, so let's have our panelists talking about their understanding of applying a gender lens to this housing question for women. Um, are we doing enough to ensure safe and secure housing? Uh, for, for women and children. Well, no, we're not, so we'll hear about their ideas <laughs> and we do more. Um, what are the particular barriers that we should be thinking of um, for those, you know, really complex needs around women and children? Um, and firstly, and, and finally, I mean, from, from each of the three of you, uh, what's going to be your big take into the state election in just under 100 days' time that might have some lasting impact on this complex problem that faces us around women and homelessness and women and violence. So first of all, um, uh, I'm going to actually ask Fiona um, to kick off with your take on the idea of the kind of gender lens. It's clearly something that's been missing in action for decades. So how do we actually start to systematically apply gender lens to questions such as women and housing? It needs to be, thanks, thanks Mary, and um, hi Sam, hi Emma. Um, it, this needs to be a whole government response. There is absolutely no doubt about this. Um, 
you know, when we look at the drivers to women's homelessness, um, it's, it's gender equality, comes down to it. It's family violence. Um, so having that specific gendered lens, um, how that works out in the land of the housing providers is, is something that the report really gave some, the homelessness report gave some considered thought to. But it is driving, you know, it's, it's driving inequality. It's reducing inequality is, is where we have to go. It's, it's wage equity. It's, um, it's addressing the causes of, of family violence. Um, it's looking at, well, you know, I mean, I suppose that the most um, uh, tragic uh, symptom of this is that we're seeing the fastest growing cohort of, home, of people being, who are experiencing homeless women over 55. Um, and that's certainly family violence, but it is also just goes down to the, the pay gaps and the fact that they've taken most of the parental care and they've taken time out. Um, but, yeah. Great to be with uh, you all here, and thanks very much for the invitation to be part of this important forum. I want to start by acknowledging, um, as well as our First Nations people, the incredible uh, expertise and wisdom that sits in this room uh, with sector experts and workers. So thank you for all the work that you do. In response to the question <coughs> about applying, how important it is to apply the gender lens to this issue of women's housing, I would argue that to not apply a gender equity lens is to be discriminatory because you just have to look at the numbers as Fiona has referenced. With over around two thirds of people seeking specialist homes, uh, the services being women, the fastest growing cohort now being women over the age of 55, around 31 percent increase has been documented in some of that recent and those recent statistics. I was reading recent. Um, why don't we see as just one of the service providers talking about you know, the quantum of 400, or 450 women seeking services, only 45 being able to be helped just because of the scarcity of resources to be able to support women. It really points to the fact that our housing, crisis, housing affordability crisis affects everyone, but it affects different groups in different ways, and women being a particularly uh, disproportionately affected group. And we know that's because uh, that women are exposed to vulnerability around housing stress, um, that puts them at risk of homelessness. We know that the drivers of homelessness around family breakdown, family violence, poverty do affect women disproportionately. Um, we also know that women have specific housing needs, which is why we need to start applying this gender lens to this work as a matter of agency. Thank you, Samantha. Um, Emma, your take on the application of the gender lens. Um, thank you very much and uh, thank you to all of you for coming along and uh, supporting this fantastic initiative. I really appreciate your time. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today. I'm 400 kilometres away from you in the west of Victoria, but I can assure you that housing issues impact on our women just as it does as women who live in Melbourne, in the suburbs, and in the CBD. Uh, and also thank you very much to Fiona and Sam for coming along today. It's great to have your support. Uh, and I think we're all on the same page when it comes to this. There's absolutely no doubt that there are critical challenges in terms of that emergency short-term housing support, particularly for women and their children fleeing family violence. But there are also critical challenges that I think women face in a more nuanced way in terms of securing rental properties and long-term housing. So uh, it's a very, very tight rental market, as we all know, and if there is any reason to mark somebody as not being suitable, uh, which may include having children, uh, may include uncertainty around employment, uh, they are risk that usually the woman will carry into their application for longer-term housing. And we know so often that throughout family violence situations that women are left with very little in their bank accounts. They can't afford a deposit on a home. They can't afford to, uh, to then also pay for their children's education and have food on the table uh, to afford to fill up a car with petrol, all those cost of living issues that we see today. And it, it's critically important that we do ensure that we have a housing system, both emergency and for long-term housing, that meets that critical need, that these are very special needs that women, particularly women with families, have in order to access 
injuring housing, long term housing support for them. Uh, so I think we're also on the same page. We need to make sure we have a proper government response to housing and the housing crisis that we've got in Victoria. But that response must take into account the additional challenges that women face in terms of limited financial situation, limited access to finances, um, the, that they may have children with them, and that sometimes it becomes easier to scrub them off the list of wait lists than it is for other uh, people who are working or support don't have children with them. Um, Emma, just a follow up question to you. Um, you actually represent the seat of Lowen, which, which I understand I think is the largest electoral district in the state. So, you know, for city people, we're talking about from Castleton to Warwick <coughs> to Rainbow, right across to Aurora. So, uh, are there some distinctively more remote rural issues and over such a large area? Um, does that give a particular edge to this question of housing and domestic violence as well um, that makes it uh, a particular intersection of geography and rurality and housing shortage? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. I, I, I'll, if I can deal with that with a few different sections, one's around family violence. There is limited access to support anyway in our rural area. Uh, if you do know someone who has, a, you know, is a counsellor and may have some experience in family violence, it's very likely that you work with them or you know them or you play football netball with them, and so. You, it, you have to overcome a significant barrier of you're not just confiding to one person you might feel like you are then confiding with your entire community just by coming forward in that scenario. Also, we've got a critical shortage of access to emergency housing at the moment. It means it's been a larger centre like Horsham. Horsham is the largest, uh, largest uh, town in my electorate. If you need emergency housing, you're very unlikely to be able to access it here. And most women would have to go to Ballarat, uh, which is a couple of hundred kilometres away. And when you're looking at a scenario where you've got children, it, it means that you have to take them out of school, you have to take them away from uh, their friends and their other support networks that you've got. You have to be able to have access to transport because often public transport isn't even an option, so you have to have a car. It just becomes very, very difficult to get those supports, whether it's um, support to get through family violence, whether it's about uh, access to emergency housing and in line the truth, there's 317 families that are currently on the waiting list in the town. Yeah, abortion, 16,000 people. It's a huge number of people who, who are homeless at the moment, uh, couch surfing and the like, and it's something that we just desperately need more answers on. And, and critically, housing is so expensive now, you can't get a rental account. You know, at least three hundred and fifty dollars a week for a rental. It's simply unaffordable uh, for so many people, but particularly for women who, you know, are in critical situations where they've got a number of children. Particularly, if you're looking at three or more kids, uh, there just isn't any public housing available. There's no emergency housing available, and there's nothing available in the private and uh, private rental arena either, unless you've earned really good money. Um, Emma, thank you, because I think that shows too that we've got to be very careful not to become city-centric when we're talking about housing policy and um, programs. So thank you for that. Um, turning now to our panelists to a, a different question, which is around safe and secure housing. Um, maybe starting with you, Samantha, um, apart from policy directions you might be heading in, but what do you think goes to the core of providing safe and secure housing? For women and children. What are the absolute core things we need to be doing in front of mind? It begins with building a whole bunch more public housing as a starting point. And to that point, starting to think about and focus on universal solutions as well as the specialist solutions. So it's really important for us to think about the specialist needs. The presentations before talking about the interactions between the different sectors, and I speak with a deep, deep affection for this work as well because I'm a social worker, I've been a social worker for many years. Uh, worked in settlement services and family services and when I left the sector got into politics full time about five years ago at that time we were working with the asylum seeker centre support service calling housing services who we work so closely with 
but housing services at that point getting to the point where they're saying, I'm sorry, or we've got our sleeping bags, and I never thought that I would get to a point in my career where that was the response on the phone, and I know how heartbreaking it was for the housing group on the other side, end of that line, to have to say that to us, and I'm sure it's only got worse in the last few years as well. So it starts with keeping an eye on the big picture solutions, and that's one of our role in our parliaments as well, um, to really push governments to not take that off the table, because it's really important we get the housing stock from that point, we can start then thinking about, I mean, we're always planning for the specialist services and that happens in parallel. But one thing I worry about is if we give in to the kind of incremental approach, which is we have to think about the kind of most urgent cohorts, the most urgent uh, emergency situations all the time, we're constantly chasing our tail because the, the center hasn't been provided for enough housing stock to begin with. We're constantly going to be going into circles and just following one crisis after another. So I absolutely recognise and value the need for specialist services, this kind of work to bring the different sectors of family violence and housing and women's services together, absolutely. One of the things that we are really pushing for is that big build of public housing because we know and we've seen international examples of this, when you get that right, everything becomes much, much easier. All the problems don't go away, of course, however, it becomes far easier to get people into housing, provide the special support they need, and ensure they don't have to cycle back through violence and um, absolute trauma because the service system has let them down at the time they needed it the most. Thank you, Samantha. Fiona. Um, oh, thanks, Erin. Uh, Sam's absolutely right. I mean, we need more housing. And, and it's interesting, I've just been in Scotland where they built 100 thousand houses in 11 years and so it can be done and Scotland is the same size around the same size of population as, as Victoria is so it's entirely possible um, it needs some policy changes but I think the other area and this was this was something that the report went to is how do we prevent people from becoming homeless and I think this is a really important part of it yes we need to build more homes that is undeniable but how do we stop how can we prevent people from becoming homeless and, and I think that you know we know employment is one of the biggest protectors we know education is a big protector so how do how can we focus on those areas how can we start that early intervention and there's there's some great programs like the Geelong project which um, you know took a long time to be recognized and to get funding here in, here in Victoria, and in fact, I think it got funding in other jurisdictions before it did here. But those are looking at those early interventions and, and prevention. So I think that we can't, that should never be forgotten, the importance of doing that. Um, but safe and secure, I think, it, you know, it, um, in the previous um, presentation, you know, why wasn't housing put into orange doors? You know, these things like, such an extraordinary oversight when you when you're prevent, presenting um, this kind of one no wrong door approach uh, for family violence, and you haven't put housing in there. Like it's, um, I mean, these are things that you know. I'm sure you know. I'm sure the um, orange doors are being reviewed, and I, I would hope that we will see see that remedied. Um, but what what as as you know. <laughs> We're constantly at the acute end, and and all of you are dealing with the acute end. And, and hearing Sam say, you know, getting on the phone and being told that a sleeping bag is the only option, um, we've we've got to we've got to, to stop this, stop ourselves much earlier. And Emma, can we hear from you on this particular question? Yeah, absolutely. I I think that government could be doing a lot more, and I. I I agree wholeheartedly that it should be incorporated with the Orange Door. I think the Orange Door has evolved a lot since the first one was rolled out. Um, we're just about to have our localised Orange Door open in August. Hopefully we can fill the staffing role. But I just think that the fact that we're able to build a massive quarantine facility with 500 beds in a very short period of time for uh, as an urgent quarantine centre over the COVID pandemic that's costing $6.5 million a, a month to keep open. We can pull that together super quickly, but we can't pull together 
emergency accommodation even for women who are fleeing family violence. I just am concerned that the Royal Commission to Family Violence came, it was a priority for five years, and then the Royal Commission into Mental Health was coming to being, and in some ways, that window of opportunity we've got have had for significant change in the family violence arena has sort of gone behind us and we haven't yet achieved all that the Royal Commission aspired to achieve. We're still seeing rising rates of family violence. We still have critical issues when it comes to providing enough support for women to enable them to leave, to not see that actually if I can't leave because I haven't got a house, I'm at risk of being in a car, sleeping in a car, maybe with kids, maybe three or more kids, I'll have to then move away from the area. It's all too much for me to give that up in lieu of putting up with him hitting me. And I think that that is so desperately sad for within our community that we haven't prioritised housing as a key element of how we can empower and enable women to make strong decisions around what's best for them and best for their families. So I absolutely agree we should have much more focus on providing safe and secure housing for women. It can be done. Uh, the Mifflin Project proved that we could do it very, very quickly with our choir led. It's not gorgeous, it's not a beautiful scenario, it's definitely not long term enough for like accommodation, but it at least provides an outlet and shows we can do some model of housing, get it done quickly and try to start to meet the need of women right across Victoria. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'd just like to um, introduce a little um, a link here that picks up on, on what the three speakers have spoken about. And then back in 2016, um, the Women's Trust held a major gathering um, at the Melbourne Town Hall called Breakthrough for Gender Equality. And, and one of our, um, the few male speakers that was allowed to present um, at that conference was Dr. Richard Dennis from the Australian Institute. And I'd really urge you to, to um, go to our website and just key in Richard Dennis and up will come his speech. Because it's as current now uh, as ever, um, because he spells out the three great lies that political, our political system and our politicians have been telling women for 120 years. Um, I'll give you a clue. The first one is they'll say, you've got yourself into this problem, you've been making the wrong choices. The second problem, or the second thing they'll tell you, the second big lie is, we need more evidence from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Richard says, evidence is what powerful people tell to powerless people to go and collect, to keep them busy, and to provide the veneer over their own inaction. <laughs> and the third big lie, the third big lie is we can't afford it. Exactly. Yes. And as Richard says, we're one of the richest countries in the world. Um, we can afford almost anything. We can't afford everything, but we can afford pretty much anything. The question is, do we give it a priority? So I really urge you to go to that. Um, it will make you feel even more bolshy, <laughs> which is a great thing. So I'd urge you to read that. Um, but I also wanted to use that as a segue to Emma and Samantha and um, Fiona today as three women now in the political system, uh, doing great jobs, I might add. Um, but I think we're at a critical moment in the last several years um, and ahead of us in uh, of us getting used to, thankfully, seeing many more women, capable women, at the political tables, both state and federally, especially in the last federal election. But I think a lot of the boldness and the bravery in Victoria, for example, has been coming because people like Fiona and Samantha and women in, in um, the National Party, Liberal Party and the Labor Party have been prepared to start raising issues and taking issues up that have been dormant for so long or, or not acted upon, like the sister dying and so on. Those really tough, gritty issues. So I'd like to put a question to the three of you today about um, is, there, is there now an opportunity we haven't had before where women such as yourselves can just flex your muscles on behalf of 
every woman in this state and to just start to get a level of boldness and a bigger, a bigger slice of the pie out of the political system because we can afford it. Samantha. You go first. I absolutely hope so, and I think that's absolutely possible. We just saw what happened with the federal election. There is a moment that has arrived, a long time coming, where we, we more and more women occupy those seats in our parliaments right across the country. And in my experience of, I was in local government before I was in state parliament, um, my experience, I was really lucky as well when I got elected to local government, it was the first in our area of a female majority local government. It was 6-5 out of Council of 11, but I tell you, it did make all the difference, although we represented a broad range of political parties, you know, often with competing policy priorities, but there were issues that galvanised us, like women's safety, and I remember this really potent discussion that happened as our term started, and it was women coming to the table with lived experience of feeling unsafe, knowing the type of solutions that are going to keep us safe by preventing the violence that happens to us, not just trying to catch the perpetrator after the fact, that changed the conversation and the type of resources we put into um, the women's safety. And I see that in the State Parliament too. I think it's not just the issues we bring to the table, it's the way we deal with those issues. And there is a real moment to bring that type of collaboration and that dialogue that women are so good at doing that has been you know, really missing in our spaces of decision making to change the way we do things. So working on parliamentary inquiries, Fiona and I work quite closely on a couple of parliamentary inquiries. You know, there's some spaces of collaboration that can really further the agenda. Getting the homelessness inquiry up actually was an act of the crossbench, this really broad section of the crossbench, collaborating together. And it's a real motley crew, right? There's a whole range of people on the crossbench. But there was this moment of unanimity where we all went, there was another one of our colleagues who put up the inquiry, it was personally very important to him. And we worked through the procedure, like in this really unique way, it was outside the normal procedure to say, how do we back this in as a crossbench together? And we got it up because we worked together. And I really am hopeful that as more and more women and we get more diversity in our parliaments representing all types of lived experience, professional backgrounds, demographic characteristics, it really starts to change the way we start to make decisions. And one thing I'd like to see is us really talking about housing and ambition is to really commit to a plan to end homelessness. It's something that the Greens put on the agenda, we've introduced a bill into Parliament, putting housing as a human right into Victoria's Human Rights Charter, saying that the government has to develop a plan to end homelessness by 2030. From that, it then has to every year account to the people and the Parliament about what it's done to achieve that goal, which we know will mean building at least 100,000 new public homes in the next 10 years. We've seen Scotland do it, that's really um, reassuring as well for us. So it's that type of stuff that you put ideas on the table and then build support for it, and that's our job now, is to build support for the big ideas and not let um, governments of the day get away with just incrementalism and you know pushing these issues further down the road. Thanks, Samantha. So Emma, up to you. Do you see that, I mean, you've been in the Victorian parliamentary system for close to five or six years, I think. Do you see... Eight some, years now. Eight years. Okay. Do you, do you see... Do you see this, uh, do you, do you see this growing potential that you know that women can in fact make substantial differences on these big policy issues? Yeah, absolutely. And in many ways, I think that it's you know we're very fortunate. You know, Fiona, Sam, and myself, and and all of our female parliamentary colleagues, because we're all being given the opportunity to speak in the media, engage in, in forums like this and to share the message of how important it is that we do put a gendered lens over so many aspects of government policy and to call it out when it's not fair. But I think we're also part of a bigger network of women right across our community. Uh, this, and I think there's a really strong opportunity to join together beyond political you know, groups. It doesn't matter if you're a member of the crossbench or the oppositional government. You know, we all have all got a, a responsibility as women in our community to join together as a strong joint force for it and joint force to make a difference and to make sure we do finally achieve our level of gender equity. Uh, this morning in Horsham, we've had a fabulous breakfast meeting. There's a new group that's just start, started called uh, Women Are Women Connect. Now, this is something that has the second meeting. Uh, they wanted to try and start really small uh, but we had a break here of 40 women today for a thing that was basically happened through a hidden way that no one really knew about. And one of the things that really cut through for me is that 
There are women who moved to our town three years ago who haven't met anyone who haven't created that network or their friend network or their or professional network because there haven't been any events. And I just think we're in magical opportunities. You know, after these restrictions on lockdowns, people are crying out to be part of a new network and a new collective. And I think if us as women can lead that story, if we can join these voices together, I think that this momentum will continue to build in the community. And if we as parliamentarians, we're like a female male, we need the men in the room to be our advocates as well. If we can harness that, then I really think we're up for a significant change when it comes to equality over the next three to five years in particular. I can feel the momentum building. I hope you can too, but it's not just in politics, it's happening at a grassroots level and we all need to listen to that and I think we can influence some significant change. I'm really excited about it. That's great. That's very heartening. Um, and let's hope that Emma, you and Samantha and Fiona can put lots of noughts on the budget bits. <laughs> Fiona, what do you think? Um, you're absolutely right, Mary, and I think we certainly, I know when I was first elected, and I, you know, I didn't even know where the toilet was, and I was called, although there, there's a lot of gender neutral toilets in, in Parliament, only because there were no women's toilets, and they just had to let us use the toilets. Um, but I remember, you know, really it was almost like the first day of Parliament and I was whispered, Jala Pulford, you know, pulled me aside and said, meeting in my room, 3pm, um, talking about women's health. And I went, okay, I have no idea where her room was, but anyway, I found it. And there in the room were members from the Greens, members from, um, there wasn't an act in the room because it was an upper house and, there, and Melina had, and we didn't have a, a nap woman at the time in the house, but, but we had liberal women, greens women, labor women, um, and had crossbenchers like myself there, um, talking about how do we ensure that there is no move backwards on abortion law. And we, we were all there, we were all on the same page, we all agreed, and, and it, was a, it was a really wonderful moment for almost my first day in Parliament to see that, that working together. I wish there was a government member here today, and I, because, you know, like, I don't have the checkbook. Um, you know, after this election, uh, Emma might have the checkbook. Um, I'm not going to have the checkbook. I'm going to be able to nudge and lobby and push and, you know, and do everything in my, uh, everything that I can, but the government hasn't even responded to the homelessness report. And they, they know they speak to all of you. They, they understand the issue, but getting them to actually um, come to the table and come to the room, and, and, it's, and it's not about berating them about what they haven't done. It's about talking about what's possible and what we can do. And, you know, by, and, and I think, you know, probably women are able to do that more easily um, when, we're, when we're around a table. But, they do. They have to come to the table, and they do have to listen. And I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not angry. I'm just a little bit disappointed. Um, me too. Also, ditto the same. <laughs> 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 no, it is disappointing. Um, people have been approached. You know, I've been filled in by telling me about this over the weeks and who's coming and who's not. So it is disappointing. So that's the empty chair. <laughs> <laughs> But I think don't let them off the hook. No. Um, you know, make sure that you all um, approach your local members and your candidates and your ministers in the next 100 days um, about the issue of women and housing. Um, we need to move on a little bit. Um, just quickly, a quick response from the three of you as to, to what, what do you see as one or two of the most significant barriers that are there um, in terms of women's access to safe and secure housing? Samantha, we'll start with you, and then Emma and Fiona. The lack of affordable housing, so just the uh, scale of the housing that's needed and the gaps we've got to now in Victoria, our public housing we've had a housing waiting list to at over 120,000 people. That was about 80 something, we said 80,000 when I stepped out of Parliament a few years ago. So it's just exponentially increasing. On any given night, 25,000 Victorians experience homelessness. So we know the scale of the problem is really big and really urgent. And urgent and it starts with building more public housing. 
and starting to address the housing affordability issues that happen um, on the continuum. For range of people, as Fiona mentioned previously as well, working at the prevention stages, we heard to a homelessness inquiry and very powerful evidence being presented to about the numbers of people <coughs> who are precarious, insecure, or overcrowded housing space before they actually end up homeless. And then the intersectionality, we're thinking about specific needs for women, people escaping family violence. We've been doing some work with uh, multicultural communities, women from multicultural communities who are crying out for uh, culturally specific women's shelters as a safe place, culturally sensitive place they can go to when they are escaping family violence. So really listening to communities about the specific needs they, uh, they need as well will be part of the solutions in the community. Would you nominate as one of the one or two of the significant barriers that need to be dismantled? Um, I, I would probably cover off on a few of them, but you know, just this year, availability of housing and housing which is set aside for both emergency accommodation and longer term accommodation, but also has been has been covered off in, in some of the material that you went through as part of us speaking today. We need to make sure that we have appropriate supports in place for women and children as well to navigate through the system. Um, I have a, a lovely young woman who I met a few years ago who was homeless, she was living under a bridge. Uh, we got her into emergency accommodation at that stage and got her into public housing. It was a big fight, it was great. We also got her teeth fixed, which made an amazing change for her because she smile, which made a massive change for her. Uh, she settled down. And I thought that she had a life on track um, and, and was getting there. I met her again a couple of weeks ago. She had a couple of children. Uh, she uh, had been in a, a public housing, which had unfortunately um, caught on fire. It was an arson attack by a violent partner. Uh, and she was in emergency housing and being told that she'd been there for a certain period of time, her time in emergency housing was coming to an end and she'd have to move out. And she had nowhere to go. And she was absolutely devastated. And for someone who, you know, she'd been really, really dealt with difficult hands in life, to finally feel like she, you know, I'd seen the light back in her, I'd seen her on the right track. And then she had a lack of certainty over where her children would sleep next week was really harmful and I think that sometimes the structure around, you know, of you've been in this house for this much time, it's emergency, you can't stay here any longer, without that support and understanding of, let's just support the woman on her journey to make sure she's, the services about her, not about the house or the labor, that's, I just think we need to do more in that space and in many ways that's going back to the Royal Commission into Family Violence and as they're seeing, have we achieved all the aspirations of the Royal Commission or are there areas that we've like fallen behind uh, that have been seen as maybe tick the box exercise where we're not delivering for women? And you know, I think this conference has put and highlighted some of those key issues, but certainly supporting a woman through the journey and making sure there's enough housing for her and to set her up for long term in terms of that healing process as much as just getting a roof over someone's self uh, Someone's like a group of someone here, I think, is really essential as part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, thanks. And I obviously concur with my colleagues here. Um, you know, look what happened during COVID when we increased um, the pension. You know, remarkable. So, um, rent increases in rental assistance, and it hasn't gone up. In, to, in, in, not even in line with CPI in particular, but certainly not in line with the cost, with the ever-growing cost of housing. Um, so that, you know, that could fix a lot. Um, and it, it also, you know, I, certainly, obviously, we need more houses as well. I think where Emma was going is, was talking about that, that kind of trauma-informed care, because we know that a lot of women who enter into homelessness they are experiencing trauma at a different level to some of the, the men who are experiencing homelessness. And our services, you know, our service funding is, is often so rigid. So we can provide you with three months of care or, you know, or, you know, and then you have to come back in for another three months. So we need to be able to tailor the services that we're providing for, you know, for the particular needs of 
the client that we're providing it for. So some people might only need a little bit of help in the first couple of weeks, in the first few weeks. Others may need ongoing help. And that, you know, that certainly takes us back to the, the house and first model, but it also, um, I think it reflects on some of the rigidity um, and, and of, of the systems that we have today in our, in our funding for homelessness services. Um, I'd like to create a little bit of time for some questions to the panellists from yourselves. And I wonder if I can kick it off by um, a question to the panel from myself, based on a really great question from um, an audience member um, earlier um, this afternoon, which is about the invisibility of men in this picture. Um, and it's something similar to the abortion debate that's raging in America and even here. You know, that the, I angrily keep saying to myself, excuse me, who impregnated in the first place? Um, and it's just that notion that the men involved in these situations go unaccountable. They, they create these problems, they're unaccountable, um, they don't take responsibility for it, and the women, women bear the brunt. Um, and similarly with the housing and the, violence, the escape from violence. So the question from the audience member was about what are we doing to actually enable women to stay safe and secure in their homes uh, and to take the blokes out of the violent um, household and to look after them, I'm not saying drop them into the ocean, um, but to look after them. Um, and so there are some Aboriginal programs, men's programs, that are doing this superbly. They take the blokes out and they wrap around support and services and behaviour change for their men. And yet the behaviour change budget in the federal budget, it's maybe 11 million or something. It's just, it's not even, it's not even chicken feed. So the question, my question to you quickly is, how do we bring the visibility and the accountability of men back into these issues for heaven's sake? Yeah. Um, absolutely, Mary. And you know, there, 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 there's certainly a big part, you know, probably in this room. Um, trying to do that, trying to enable ways for for, fa for, for women and, and children to stay in the family home safely. But making men accountable. Um, and, you know, it doesn't happen. And in some ways it needs to. That, that, that those, those, you know, it's, it's not, yes, wrap services around, yes, I, I help them with their issues and, and behaviour and, and certainly do that. But in some ways, I, I kind of want their peers to also kind of make them accountable. You know, when you know when women um, are escaping violence, you know, we it, it's it's quite often it's a shame. It's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's almost a guilt um, for women that they've done that they're somehow at fault and that they're somehow leaving. And we never put that back on the men. And I think we need we need to do that. Um, so that is absolutely men taking greater accountability. Samantha, what do you think? I was just thinking about this environment that we often spend a lot of time with, which is in Parliament, and thinking about how we can use those levers as well. Wouldn't it be, as, as I mentioned before, I do believe that more women around the table changes both the, the things that we're talking about and the ways that we make those decisions. But wouldn't it be nice if it wasn't just left up to the women to bring up these issues that affect all of society, our children, you know, generations, but often it is left to the women to bring up those issues. So us really bringing our colleagues up to task and you know issuing the task to them as well to bring those issues to the table so it's not just the women who have to keep championing and advocating and really pushing uphill for the basics like housing life free from family violence so perhaps one of the things that we can take back is what we can do with our um, spaces of decision making to change that conversation but also ensure those conversations are set with new parameters which isn't about men coming in and taking over the conversation, which is sometimes what happens because there's this need to fix things and be the saviour of it, but deeply listening to women's issues. And I think that's why getting more women elected to our parliaments is all about, it changes the way we have those conversations and role models how can have those conversations differently. And certainly that's something I, can, I think it can speak for all of us that we're deeply committed to changing the way our parliaments work and getting that gender diversity starting to do that, I believe. Thank you. And Emma, a quick response from you for some audience questions around rendering men more visible in these problems? Yeah, look, I, I think that we really need also more support in place to allow behavioural change programs to take place 
before we get to the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, which is how the family violence system operates so often now. It's for many women, they're just not willing to make that large step of that bit you have to leave him if you're a victim of family violence. There are many, many women at many, many steps in between who are seeing red flags, they're seeing an escalation where they're not being treated the way that they want to, but we have not got nearly enough educational support for women to understand how to have that conversation that that's not okay to treat me like that. We haven't got nearly enough support and education for men get that area before it gets there, very violent. And even when it does get violent, we've seen a cut in funding to men, men's behavioural change programs. So I think that structurally we can do a lot more in the space between, you know, happy relationships that's all good and then you must leave because it's a really violent relationship. And I think that's where we can invest as a preventative measure that Fiona was talking about, but really specific about different pathways that women can step out, get some support, and perhaps have more confidence to be able to leave a violent relationship that's simply not improving. Thank you, Emma. Are there any questions from audience members? Yes. Hands shooting up there. Yep. And Jeanette, I'm grinning a bit of your time. <laughs> the next one. <laughs> yeah, I've got two points I wish to make. The current focus question is in regards to existing rental properties owned by investors that are lying vacant for extended periods of time. What can government do to incentivise people to not leave properties vacant? So, part two um, <laughs> yeah. in regards to more of a future focus, you brought up the example of Scotland. Well, in terms of overseas with private pension funds, um, for example, the UK, they put back over 20% back into the social housing market. So when we look at here in superannuation, we have over a trillion dollars in funds under management. What is government doing to actually make it more attractive for superannuation funds to do impact investing? It's a great question. And I think, I think the, the first point is, you know, last term we introduced a vacancy tax. Um, in Victoria, and it was, you know, it was a good idea, but it's, um, it's, it's kind of an honesty system. So you put your hand up and, and pay it. No, so it's, so guess what? No one pays it. Um, so I think, you know, actually enforcing the vacancy tax, we do need to think. When this on the census night, one million empty homes in Australia, we do need to rethink those investor homes, we need to rethink the tax the taxation around that. Um, and I know that, you know, the, the current the new the new federal government, you know, was not going to mention um, negative gearing in this election at any cost, but we do need to do it. And I think that that could be incentivising affordable housing. Looking at what Scotland and the UK have done and certainly in incentivising um, superannuation funds but also mandatory inclusion rezoning. They said it at 20, 25, 20 to 25%. We couldn't even get to 10% here. Um, but, and and it, it, it actually it creates jobs. It's, um, you've got the not-for-profit sector who've got easier access to funds than some of the, the for-profit developers. So you, you've actually created this really strong ecosystem of, of housing development um, over there that it also provides services. So this is possible, but we need, so states states probably need to start looking at inclusion rezoning and looking at enforcing our vacancy taxes, looking at what we're going to do about, around vacancy. Emma, do you have any quick response to that question? Yeah, look, I think we need to look at every single opportunity to rapidly unlock housing stock, uh, whether it's sitting vacant because it's the second residence at Holiday House, or what we see in our part of the world is houses in on farms that aren't quite up to scratch. So the kitchen, you know, the same as it's been from the 1940s or 50s in the bathroom, it's a bit run down. And we've seen some of our communities come together to do localised migration projects where they'll get hold of the house or buy it as a community and then upgrade it so it's up to scratch. Still very simple, but new kitchen, new bathroom. Might just be a kit kitchen, but it's fine. And again, that's just a way of unlocking houses for the market. I think we also need to look at 
you know, but have we got the line right for tenancy laws that there is a then an exodus of landlords who are pro providing rentals, recognising that not everybody can afford a deposit for a home. We also need to look at Airbnb. It's now more attractive for people to rent out a room on Airbnb one or two nights a week. It means that it's taking a lot of the rental properties off the market. Um, I think there needs to be an all over review of how we can unlock the housing stock we have in the state already, and I think that would go a long way towards provide more housing for women. Agree with everything that's said, a more enforcement for the vacancy tax for it to work, increasing it, doubling it to start with, plus short stay regulation. Victoria's actually has a very lax system of short stay regulation. We're seeing all sorts of problems on either of the spectrum creep up because of that. Uh, so it's really important that we push for much greater regulation of short stays um, for the overuse and underuse of properties as well. Thank you. And um, you made me realise with your focus on superannuation and the treatment sitting in there. That's right. But I'm going to get in contact with my superannuation fund tomorrow, Verve, started by women, for women, of women, uh, and I'll ask them what they're doing about um, diverting and encouraging their investment in housing for women. Good question. Um, okay, any other questions? Hi, Julia Watson from RMIT, <laughs> Um Fiona, you mentioned Scotland, which I'm really glad that you brought up, um, because some really exciting things are happening there. And it is comparable to Victoria, yeah, it's right. um, But I guess uh, uh, one of the great supports I have there is that they have statutory homelessness. And that has helped kind of prompt a very strong housing first response and building. And Sam, you mentioned also about getting this into the charter. So, so actually having homelessness um, recognised as a human right and in the charter means that the government does actually have to respond. It's held accountable in a way, but it's not held accountable now. Recommendation 32. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what is the support for this and how can we make it happen? <coughs> Uh, we introduced it into the Parliament not long ago, a couple of months ago, and it was really interesting because often these kind of campaigns, when you're introducing something like this, that's, you know, notionally people say, oh, it's a really good idea, but when you actually push comes to shove and you want to get their support for legislative change, it all becomes very, very hard. It often takes a while to build up a campaign, but I was very pleasantly surprised that it just took off sort of in a couple of days. I think it spoke to the recognition of the problem that we we're experiencing, and it's touched our lives in all different ways. Um, we know that housing affordability is touching people's lives um, in increasingly urgent ways. So that bodes well. Uh, it is now going to be really important, particularly in the lead up to the state election, that we keep that as a focus. Um, keep asking the government whose plans to end homelessness. So no longer frame the conversation in uh, and allow people to get away with saying, we're going to just put a bit more money here and a bit more money there. While the money's welcome and we always want that support, allowing people just to pledge that as their solution uh, allows them not to then speak about the whole scale solutions that we need, which is including housing as a human, you know, as, a, as a right in Victoria's human rights charter. And he's asking governments to actually have a plan to have targets and to be accountable for meeting or not meeting those targets. It's not a new thing. We've seen countries across the world grapple with these, the example of Finland too, which is essentially eradicating street homelessness because of a big build of public housing. So it's possible we have precedents and it's all our jobs now and the community's job is to push the government and frame it in a way that asks government to make the big choices and make the big decisions, not just the small ones. Um, Emma, did you want to add anything to that? No, agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just standing between you and then we can drink. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just room. Um, so I'd like to pull it together. Um, and I guess the last question that Tanya had supplied me with was to ask each of these women what would be their priority going into the election. But I'm going to do away with that because I think you've sensed their priorities. <laughs> what I would say is. Um, uh, how fantastic it is to hear from you, Emma, and Samantha and Fiona, um, to to hear these three women be so across the issues uh, uh, and to speak with the rigour and the passion that is needed around this issue. My comment would be, with the state election coming up, is ask yourselves how can you help Samantha <laughs> and Emma and Fiona take this issue up into the party systems um, in our state. Um, uh, they're obviously very approachable. You've seen that. 
um, and, and they're dedicated to the issue, you're seeing that. So I think how can you value add uh, to the work they're doing around the political table is a big question for you as well, um, and encouragement to do so. Um, so on behalf of all of you here, um, I'd like to thank Samantha and Fiona and Emma, and, and Emma in particular to thank you. It's hard being um, uh, on the screen like that. Uh, it takes a special kind of focus on things. So, so thanks heaps for you not being in person today, but being prepared to come and talk the way you have. Uh, and thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Samantha.